Harbor, England, the Mayflower Second lies at anchor, a famous ship come to life again after three centuries in the pages of history. She's as accurate a replica of the original as scholars and shipwrights could make her, a gift of Englishmen to America, an historical tribute far removed from the usual solemn ceremonies and weighty books. This tribute to history takes the form of living adventure. 337 years after the original set sail for the New World, on the landing stage from which the pilgrims departed, Plymouth's Lord Mayor bids the ship's company Godspeed and smooth sailing. Ceremonies are ended, the adventure about to begin, with the attention of the world focused on this voyage. An ironic contrast to the pilgrims' unheralded departure from their own land in search of freedom and a new life. 1620 and 1957 are separated by far more than mere passage of time. Crewmen had to master a complex tangle of rigging, memorizing more than 50 ropes to handle the six working sails. Even to the ship's officers, experienced square rig men, to sail the cranky 17th century bark meant learning a lost art. A tiny craft to brave the broad Atlantic. She's only 90 feet long, 25 feet at her widest. But Mayflower II carries only a ship's company of 33. Her namesake sailed with 125 passengers and crew. These modern seafarers have added advantages, a perfected system of navigation, radio, accurate charts, and perhaps most important, knowledge of winds and currents. The pilgrims headed for Virginia, but wound up at Cape Cod. Captain Villiers knowingly sets his course almost due south to gain the help of the trade winds. But in many ways, the ship's company lived and worked 17th century style. Even on a small ship, that means lots of work. The diet was largely lime juice and salt beef, old time nautical staples. Their solid but monotonous menu was brightened by the watercress garden, grown in a box by the ship's doctor. Fresh greens every day. Salt beef and greens all the way without an epidemic of seasickness. That's some kind of record right there. For 16 days, the Mayflower runs southwest from England. With a steady wind and smooth seas, a high sense of adventure, and only salt water to shave in. What better time to grow a beard? Growing it is easy. Trimming it on the deck of the hard rolling ship looks downright hazardous. In the trade winds, the vessel turns the corner, heading west and meeting its first rough weather. An ugly cross sea has the ship rolling sharply. But the wind is there, and each day's voyage is longer and longer. Once, the Mayflower logged 164 miles. Life on a smooth-running ship ordinarily settles into a comfortable routine, but this is no ordinary voyage. It's the highlight of a lifetime for every man of the crew. And it's specially memorable for the 17-year-old cabin boy. His transition from landlubber to mariner is made official by Captain Villiers. One of the few Americans aboard, he earned his birth by winning a National Youth Award. His English counterpart offers congratulations on his commencement. 
Sundays saw all hands assemble on the quarter deck for religious services conducted by the captain. Worship was followed by short talks on pilgrim history or on early exploration. The day was one of rest with no deck swabbing, no chores for the crew. Twice the trade winds failed. The ship was becalmed in the horse latitudes on the worst day logging only 11 miles. The cramped quarters below deck grew unbearably hot. The men lounged on deck waiting hour after hour, day after day for a breeze. Felix was the only one indifferent to the heat and still air. The others found relief in mid-ocean swimming, many hundreds of miles from the nearest shore. At last the winds came and Mayflower's sails filled. Westward and north she sailed, re-entering the trade lanes to see other ships again after weeks on an empty sea. Mayflower II had the benefit of three centuries of seamen's experience with the Atlantic. Her southerly route was longer than the Pilgrim's course, but faster by far, thanks to more reliable winds and favoring currents. The Nantucket lightship was technically the first landfall. Real land was still over the horizon, but the ship was as good as in port. By air and sea, the triumphant little square rigger was escorted in to complete her voyage 5,435 miles under sail. In 54 days at sea, as again 66 for the original cruise, the modern Mayflower achieved a notable feat which helps our age to realize just how much more was accomplished and endured by the Pilgrim Fathers. As it was in 1620, Provincetown Harbor was the first port of call. Here, the original vessel lay offshore on her cargo of migrants to the New World drew up the Mayflower Compact, one of the great milestones in the development of Anglo-American democracy. On the shore at Plymouth, where wilderness awaited the Pilgrims, now stands the gleaming monument that houses Plymouth Rock. Instead of silent wilderness, a cheering throng greets the second Mayflower. Captain Villiers and his men receive a hero's ovation at Plymouth. Close by Plymouth Rock, where the Pilgrims first set foot in the New World, the Mayflower II will be docked permanently, living memorial to a great voyage.